the Bonsom Group CIO, founder and managing partner and author of the book Full-Time Work and the Meaning of Life. David Bonson here in studio. So David, kind of exciting day, isn't it? Lots going on. It's a big deal. And then you get all these announcements, appointments, and then at the same time having this meeting of President Biden. I think it's surreal. Right. Uh, to see it's going to happen and they know he's going to go. I mean, he's basically got a shell of a staff left. Most of them left already and went to work for the failed campaign of now. Kamala Harris. So he's got KJP as a chief advisor, Jeff Zeitz as, as chief of staff, and there's a lot of things hanging in the balance. What you heard today, wh- where do you think the status of uh, of our economy is today? I know the market had a down day yesterday, but for the most part has surged since Trump won. Yeah, there's a really, really good fundamental backdrop. And for in terms of investors and people trying to think about the market, there's just two forces in a tug of war with each other. It's a big deal. It's going to be a big deal next year. One is the really good news, strong fundamentals. I think Trump is going to be successful with deregulation with some degree of lower taxes. Um, and, and then I think that right now unemployment's very low and earnings are at record highs. Corporate profits are very high. All that, and, and this is all at a time when the Fed's getting ready to be cutting interest rates. Oh, that's very good. What's the downside? Very high valuations. A lot of this stuff is already priced in. And so you're competing of high valuations in the market against good fundamentals. The worst kind of markets are valuations going lower and bad fundamentals. We don't have that. You got good fundamentals against stretched valuations. Um, so we're looking at a market, at least say, besides the deficit, which is a problem, what I love about the Elon Musk, Vivek Ramaswamy being an assignment to for government efficiency, normally when you hear about that, you think, okay, this is going to be people spending outrageous spending, but they have no answer. Yeah. How do you feel about what you know about both men, their companies, their skill set, and what they're going to try to do? You know, uh, Ramaswamy is a, is a talented guy. One of the things I like about him on this, and I suspect it's why he's there with Elon, is the PR of it. You have to uh, really win the messaging battle here. People talk like everybody wants to cut spending and regulation. Guess what? Not everyone wants to. A lot of people benefit from some of the regulation. Half of the problem with freight, fraud, waste, and corruption is overpayment. Well, uh, the people getting the overpayments are not going to like it when they come in and clean that up. But Ramaswamy is a very good communicator. He's an articulate guy. I think he's there on that front. And then obviously, um, the, just the ability to look at this, take a sober uh, assessment and come up with real specific ideas. But I think some people are a little um, optimistic that everyone's just going to be really happy about this. They're not. People don't like having their bureaucratic fiefdom taken away from them. David Bonds and our guests. Here's it, David. I'll take a step back. Aside from execution, will they be able to identify the waste? Is it, is it hard to identify the waste in a department and to really dig underneath, especially if they don't want it exposed? Um, yes, they will be able to. Some of it will be hard, but let me give you an example, Brian. The, the government bureau itself already said there was $200 billion of excess payments, primarily to states for unemployment, Medicaid, which also goes to states, and then uh, the EITC, this earned income tax credit, which was a boondoggle, and, uh, and Medicare. People getting uh, too high a Medicare reimbursement are not very prone to want to give it back. And yeah, and so that inefficiency has to be dealt with. But though that's two hundred billion, they know about. Now, you, to your point, there's a whole lot more. If we knew about, we could do something. Someone's got to go discover it and get cooperation and looking into it. So they're going to have to pick some battles. And I'll tell you what they're going to end up doing because they're very smart guys. They're going to take something that is low hanging fruit that's outrageous to the public and go make hay of it and then get the public sentiment on their side. Go find something. You remember the Pentagon toilet seat story back in the 80s? It wasn't a ton of money, but it just sort of created the outrage you need in the public. And I think there's uh, there's two other things. So say, look, I I have identified this building. It's there's only like 20 people in a building that's six stories high. And it's time to get rid of this building. You know, they do this. Washington owns these buildings that aren't even occupied. So they look to get rid of it. And the people that push back on it, he, I can see them calling a press conference. Hey, Mr. President, can you get a press conference? Say, yeah, 12. Today, Leo Musk is going to be here with Vivek Ramaswamy to identify agencies and divisions that are refusing to reform. And that pressure will be the first time these civil, uh, these civil, and I'm not saying uh, everybody in civil service is lazy. I'm not saying that. But a lot of people are cashing in. 
Yeah, and they have different incentive structure. Even good public servants, there is a law of self-preservation where what we need is productivity. Here's the low-hanging fruit, Brian, is DEI. Because, see, notice he didn't call it the Department of Fraud, Waste, and Corruption. The DEI money has been legally apportioned. But he called it government efficiency. They can come in and identify, hey, here's $40 million that went to trying to get public education about monkeypox to a certain segment in one community. You're not kidding. It probably did that. No, it's a real-life number. Yeah. So there's things like that all over the place. I'm not even getting in Department of Education where DEI has run amok. The amount, I mean, again, state of California and UC Regents employs 800 diversity officers at hundreds of thousands of dollars per year per person. They can identify that stuff. It's it's not illegal. It's not fraud, waste, corruption, but it's inefficiency, and they, they can make public hay over it. Are the, are, in Musk's case, when you look at his companies, is he known as a cost cutter? Is he known as an efficiency guy? I think mm. of him as an inventor. Yeah, it's different for companies that aren't hyper-levered, and that's a unique thing because we're so used to debt capital driving a lot of this, and he used equity. And so on one Could hand... you describe to me for, for civilians like... Yeah, that sure. I'm sorry. So you borrow money, you got to pay it back, and you got to service the debt. So it's a cost to the company. With equity, the downside is the investors can make a lot of money. You've given away a lot of your company, but the good news is there's no cost to it along the way, right? You're not making a principal and interest payment yeah. for the debt. He funded it by continually selling more equity off to the public. So that was efficient. He had a more efficient capital structure in the way he ran the company, if that makes sense. Um, you know, look, you can't be cheap running a space exploration company or running a, an electric vehicle a, a, a car company. But I do believe that he was smart. Um, he hired expensive people, but they were good people. See, we talk as if sometimes thrift and cutting costs and austerity is always a good thing. Sometimes you got to invest into good people. So I think he has a good instinct for where to press the gas and putting more investment and resources into things and when they're inefficient. So there's this story I remember Teddy Roosevelt just reading about it for Teddy and Booker T. And, you know, he uh, helps. I, I, one of these presidents get elected, Republican get elected. Go, what do you want? He goes, well, he had a job. So they go, well, I want you here straighten out the civil service division. Yeah. And his wife tells him, I don't want you to take it. Uh, this is gonna. I've got to move to Washington for this, live in a small apartment for that salary. Mm -hmm. And he takes it. And he walks in, and from day one, he changed the whole complexion, got rid of the dead wood, motivated these people, changed the incentive structure yeah. to the point when there were Democrat wins. They say, this guy, Tay Roosevelt, he's got to stay yeah. because he inspired people. Yeah. And I know we've gotten so much bigger since then, but that this is a bigger issue now. But I'm hoping that that private sector, that incentive, don't vilify civil service workers unless you have to. Yeah. But can you change the structure? Can you recommend a change even to the civil service union to maybe get to get your star workers more more compensation? The hard part is that there's so many places you can go. There's so much inefficiency in the FDA and the EPA. Where do you go? Because if you spread too thin, you risk not really moving the needle. So you almost have to start with a couple winnable battles, go in and bank some, some wins, and then you can kind of spread throughout the rest of government. I understand. Uh, so uh, we'll see what's going on. We'll take a short time out, come back a little bit more with David Bonson. The Brian Kilmeade Show. Hey, welcome back. David Bonson here from the Bonson Group. And we're looking right now at the economy. Donald Trump is speaking. He's going to be meeting with the president, the president, 35 minutes. There's a bit of a mutiny uh, in the House, and Trump is going to try to squelch it. He is very tight with Speaker Johnson. And for people just out there, I don't want to go through this again, and I know most of you understand it. You could be the most conservative, the most moderate. You could be a rhino, whatever you want to say. If you are Speaker, you're rounding up people. You're getting a coherent message. You have a very slight majority. You could say, I need someone more conservative. Well, you're going to lose half your caucus. That's what happened with Kevin McCarthy. And if they if they put him up there and then a Matt Gates is going to stick up again, uh, it's going to hurt the whole country, let alone the cause. And Donald Trump has no time to waste. But David, when you see uh, that uh, that inflation is the number one factor, perhaps, in deciding this election. And now we understand it went up 0.2 percent. 
Is that true, the inflation rate? Month and over month. It, month it came in month? exactly as projected, 2.6 year over year. But again, 5% of that is in rents, which are not up 5%. So it's a funky thing. But I mean, the, the biggest issue that the president can do to get prices lower is produce more goods and services, right? Inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. We need more supply side. He can help on the energy side. And he can certainly just by with greater economic activity g- generate more production, which I think pushes prices. How do you lower. do that? How do you generate more production? Well, you lower tax rates and lower regulation. That's it. I mean, that's what Reagan did. Right. A, a marginal tax rate reduction. This is basic supply side economics that I think works not just to promote growth, but to de to push inflation lower, especially auto manufacturers. I imagine too. Uh, right? Absolutely. So, uh, do you think the do you think these auto companies are probably on the phone already? Go. Where are we heading? Because they know their life changed dramatically when Joe Biden won. Well, I think that the auto companies right now face a really interesting opportunity because they were pivoting into a very expensive and unprofitable venture around EV mandates. Bailing on it at and, a record and, and rate. Bailing on it because it wasn't working, but now they don't have to bail on it if they don't have to do it, and they can get back to what they normally do. It's funny. Uh, Boeing came out, the new the CEO, saying, we uh, are not looking to get rid of some of our DEI stuff because we want to focus on whether or not the things we do helps us build planes. The cars, they don't want to go through all these EV mandates. They want to build cars, sell cars. That's what they do. That's what you need that's anti-inflationary and pro-growth. And Get businesses doing business. What, when you make those statements and you know it's coming, yeah. but nothing actually happens, but you know it's heading in that direction, that's enough, correct? If oh. it's always a sincere move, I'm going to start drilling. We didn't drill today, yeah. but already it would start changing things. And that's what I understand Lee Zeldin made it pretty clear. His goal was to get those pipelines going and to release the ban. So right now yeah. we're in a pause yeah. on natural gas. On exporting natural gas, which is not just environmentally stupid and geopolitically stupid. Asia and Europe want to buy liquefied natural gas from us, but it's a growth industry. I've said this over and over again. Barack Obama would have had Negative GDP growth in his presidency if it wasn't for fracking. Okay, so which we, he had nothing to do with, by the well, way. Well, of course he didn't, but he was there, and to his credit, behind didn't the scenes, stop it. he didn't stop it. He didn't want to take credit for not stopping it until it came time to a second debate with Mitt Romney. But for the most part, he kind of was stuck in the weird position of allowing it to go, but not really being able to brag about it because of the far left environmental movement. I think that um, in this case, the export LNG ban was a terrible thing for Harris's campaign because she wanted to get past her old stupid statement of saying I want to ban fracking and yet this thing was lingering out there well this wasn't four years ago this was eight months ago your administration put a freeze on approving new terminals it takes years to build them we need these things it employs tens of thousands of people and not just basic jobs Good paying jobs, good jobs for people who don't have to have college degrees, but can make six figures with special skills. It's an advanced engineering, manufacturing. There, it's just it's a really important construction aspect of jobs. And Biden, for whatever reason, killed it. Even though prior to that, they were doing a lot with export LNG after Russia invaded Ukraine. Which is crazy because he was asked by Speaker Johnson, "Why did you pause?" Look at what excavation. He says, I haven't. We're discussing this. No, you've paused it. Yeah. And he had nothing to say. Yeah, he put Somebody a pause on. in his right. administration did it and didn't inform or he forgot. Yeah. And in government speak, when someone says we're pointing a commission, that's the way they kill things. When they say we're pausing or we're having a discussion, you know, like when I have something I have to discuss with my people about our company, we discuss it that day and make a decision that day or the next day and start our new plan of attack the day after that. We go very quickly. The government, when they talk about pausing to have a conversation, that's a year, two years. They were trying to kill it. The same thing they do with nuclear. Yeah, we didn't ever end nuclear. We just haven't done it for 30 years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's government inefficiency. Um, I want you to hear what Kevin Walling said, a Democratic campaign consultant. And tell me how this ripples down to the economy. Cut 28. Voters send an overwhelming message oftentimes that, you know, they want to see Democrats and Republicans uh, working together. This is going to be a very slim majority uh, for the Republicans in the House, getting slimmer by the day every time uh, Donald Trump appoints a new House member uh, to his cabinet and certainly a 53-47 majority uh, in the Senate. So do you think Wall Street, uh, do you think the uh, economic experts want to see cooperation between the two? Well, I know that they do. And um, in this particular case, I just want to point out, the Republicans are probably going to end up with three, four, or five-seat majority. 
Uh, if it wasn't for some of the shenanigans that have happened of division within the party, we could have 30 seat majority. We could have 20, 30 seats very easily. So yeah, you get a lot more done when you have more leverage because, uh, you have the margin matters. The committees matter and they need to be able to get along and not play performative games with one another. So, uh, I think President Trump is going to be, uh, in reinforcing that message loud and clear today. And, and by the way, we're talking to David Bonson. So David, who's the right treasury secretary? Will be the right message? Message that gives you an idea that this that the president's on the right track. Who do you want to see named? Of uh, the names that are real seriously being considered, I really like Scott Besson a lot. I think he's a very philosophical person. He has a deep understanding of what makes markets work and what uh, the dollar is about and what needs to happen in America's financial system. David Malpas's name has not been getting a lot of play. He was President Trump's choice for head of the World Bank, and he's someone I like a great deal. I think he's a real senior statesman. He has served in three presidents' administrations in the Treasury Department already. Uh, so either Scott Bessent or David Malpas. There were a couple other names I didn't like, but I think Scott's going to get the name. Jamie Diamond? Him. I would love Jamie, and I think Jamie would take it, but I don't think President Trump's going to go there. Because he didn't really support him, right? Uh, that's not the reason. I think he right now wants people that are more ideological, not that kind of Wall Street background. But sometimes a good Wall Street background can help too, Brian. David Bonson, thanks so much.